Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will start our last session, session four, Leveraging Innovative Finance for Blue Economy Growth, with moderator Luisa Cahill de Grasa, who is a senior associate in the corporate finance and energy departments of Gomez Acebo and Pombo Ambogados. We would like to invite all speakers from this session to open your camera, please, and prepare your presentations. So we're just missing Nicolas Wollett, but he is entering soon. So, uh, Louisa, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeanette. Uh, okay, we are missing Nicolas. Uh, hopefully, he will join soon. Good afternoon to all. Um, and first of all, thank you to the Wave Energy Center for inviting me to moderate this uh, session about uh, leveraging innovative finance for the blue economy growth. Um, I will start by introducing our first speaker, uh, which is Elena Vieira, uh, Director General of Maritime Policy under the Minister of Sea in Portugal. Um, Elena has over 20 years of experience in academic industry and political uh, backgrounds and, um, and also holds uh, lecturer, expert management and coordination positions in the fields of life and ocean science and bioeconomy backgrounds. Um, Elena will speak to us about uh, public funding available for the blue economy growth. Um, Elena, thank you, and uh, please go ahead. I will ask all other speakers to turn off the camera now. Thank you, Luisa. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, good. Can you see my screen as well? Yes, perfectly well. Thank you. Okay, so I'm... Um, I would like to thank the WAVEC organization for this invitation and to the introduction to, to Luisa. Uh, so I was asked to, to give a brief overview about the, the national uh, funding schemes uh, we have currently under management to foster the blue economy uh, growth. So before I start talking about uh, this funding, I would like to just set uh, a picture of what is the current uh, blue economy in Portugal. And luckily, we actually have the, the data for um, the, the latest data of the C satellite account um, that was just released on the 16th uh, of November. And this uh, data shows some interesting numbers. And the, the most interesting number is that in 2018, the sea economy reached 5.1% of the GDP. So it, it has continued a growing path uh, as predicted and, an, and, a, and a, a fast uh, growing path. It also accounts for 5% of the national exports in 2018. And actually, we can, uh, under the questions, we can discuss these numbers a bit more because it's quite interesting how people are unaware that sea products are under some of the most uh, exported products over um, olive oil and wine, for example. Uh, it also accounts for 4% of the jobs in this period, and it, it represents uh, an accumulated 3.9, almost 4% also of the VAB uh, accumulated uh, under this period. Uh, as I said, the growth has been uh, quite stunning. So it's a double digit growth and it's growing uh, almost at a double pace than the national general economy growth. So 18.5% versus 9.6, which shows two or three things that are really important to, to say. The blue economy, uh, it's a resilient uh, sector of the national economy. It's one of the fastest growing sectors also of, of the blue economy, and it represents uh, a, a, an interesting proportion of both exports and jobs. Also very interesting is to see that uh, there was an increase on the expenses of R&D uh, uh, in this uh, sector between uh, in the last uh, uh, four years, between two, 2014 and 2018. Uh, so 3.6% of all R&D uh, were spent in the sea economy. When we look this at a, at a sectorial uh, uh, perspective, 
what we see is that the biggest chunk is represented uh, by uh, tourism. Uh, I think there's a mistake here, I'm sorry, because there's two copies of the same number, um, but, it, but the, the order is correct and the difference is very small. So the tourism, recreational and sports um, are the, the most um, contributors to this uh, uh, value of the VEB and represent almost 40% of the jobs, followed by fisheries, aquaculture and transformation, uh, which I know that the jobs is about 20% uh, and I can look until the end of the, of the meeting uh, for this number here on the VAB. Then we have all the maritime services. This, in, this is a vast group of, of, of companies and this uh, represents about 9% of the jobs and, and uh, almost 11% of the VAB and then ports, transports and logistics actually. Uh, so the funding uh, available uh, here uh, we have different schemes of, of public funding and these schemes are directed towards national uh, entities so you have to be a national entity and their main focus so this means that funding is attributed to projects that promote jobs and growth in Portugal. Uh, the different fundings are designed in an attempt to be complementary so depending on the type of project you should go to one funding and not the others also in terms of stages they are uh, designed complementary so they have different amounts and different funding schemes like um, reimbursed or non-reimbursable uh, funding schemes and uh, the majority of them are designed to support productive and innovative projects not just business as usual so i will talk about uh, these uh, main uh, programs here uh, mar 2020 uh, the EEA Grants uh, Blue Growth Program, the Fundo Azul and Portugal 2020. So Mar 2020, it's uh, a FEAMP based uh, product, uh, program that funds mostly investments in fisheries and aquaculture and then the transformation industry related to these, to these fields, but also R&D related to the above. So for example, if you if you want to do uh, a productive investment in aquaculture you can uh, get um, a maximum support of uh, 6.5 million euros per operation and it's a non-reimbursing support meaning you do not have to return the money afterwards and if you're an SME you get about 50 percent of this investment value and if you're not uh, an, an SME so if you're a large company you can get up to 30 percent and the reason why these percentages are established is because this is under uh, state uh, aid rules and this means that the state cannot interfere into uh, the economy it cannot uh, positively or negatively interfere with the economy and therefore we can never give 100% uh, funding for example if you want to to do a productive investment in transformation industry so for example you know better or, or renewable uh, energy related you can get again the same amounts uh, of support it's 6.5 million per operation and this is only applicable for SMEs, 50% uh, of the investment can be covered with this grant. If we, we talk about the EEA grants, uh, the, there are several programs under the EEA grants. Uh, the program we manage under the Ministry of the Sea is the Blue Growth uh, Program and this program is focused on uh, three main areas. So there's 70% um, of the program is, is directed towards uh, companies, so SMEs, directed towards emergent blue economy sectors, innovation and internationalization of, of companies. And then the remaining 30% are divided between R&D for ocean ecosystem and resources and education and ocean literacy. So a, a much smaller part of the program goes towards these, these, these goals. This is a program that it's between donor countries, uh, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway, and Portugal uh, own uh, national funding. The program is designed to, to have approximately 44 million uh, euros in total. We have already committed in the first uh, uh, calls 10.3 million, so we have more uh, money to, to, to commit yet. We have open and closed five calls. We still have one open call this year for um, the education and, and uh, the formal education uh, part in, in Blue Economy. Uh, we will open two more calls um, in, in early 2021 for business. 
So this will be call number two and round two of call number three. And this could be up to 750,000 euros per project. And we will also open two more small grant schemes uh, calls in 2021, up to 250 thousand euros per uh, uh, SME. I can talk about this if you have any questions about these programs I can talk it, uh, in, in the questions and answers. The Blue Fund is a hundred percent national fund. There it's, it's derived by the, the national budget uh, mostly and it has some, 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 some of its own uh, income comes from for example port taxes and, and port dividends for example. Um, this program is, was designed to be uh, very complementary to MAR 2020. So it's focused on early stages like entrepreneurship and startups in blue economy. But it also has uh, three other areas, maritime security, because this was not covered by any other program, marine protection and monitoring under the, the maritime um, integrated policy, and also R&D to support these, these areas. The Blue Fund, uh, so Fundo Azul, has opened several calls. It has already 50 projects uh, approved and um, currently uh, it has uh, made um, a new instrument which is called the Portugal Blue. This is uh, an instrument of, of Fundo Azul and EFD or Banco do Fomento now uh, with uh, EIF, so the European Investment Fund. This is a 50 million uh, fund of funds that will invest in, in two national funds that will then invest in national blue economy uh, SMEs. So it's a different way of, of investing, but it's a very interesting way for us because it will uh, leverage our capacity to actually select and invest in projects. Uh, besides these, you also have the Portugal 2020 uh, program that is complementary to this. So not being specific to blue economy, you can actually find a lot of funding in the, in the Portugal 2020, for example, for productive investments, for internationalization, for um, co-promotion and R&D uh, uh, programs, for also for uh, IP. There are a lot of, uh, of, of calls under this program and the new one, the, the Portugal 2030 will be similar, where you can have financing for this. So these are the major schemes of financing we have uh, under management today to, to foster pro, uh, projects in, in blue economy. So I will stop here uh, now and I will pass. I don't know how to take this again, sorry. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, I'll introduce now our, our second speaker for uh, for this session, uh, which will be Tony Wright. Um, Tony um, is joining us from Canada and is the general manager of the Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy, which is uh, Canada's leading facility for uh, tidal stream um, energy technology. Um, and is based in the Bay of Fundy. Um, the Fundy Ocean Research Center for, for Energy hosts uh, tidal stream technology developers at the test site and also conducts environmental monitoring and research. Um, so Tony will talk to us uh, about the activity of the uh, Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy. Uh, welcome, Tony, and um, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Louisa. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Uh, and can you see my slides on the screen? All right. Yes, I can see your presentation. Okay. Perfect. perfect. So, Louisa, thank you for hosting us. I really appreciate you doing that. And to the WAVEC uh, uh, organizers, thank you for the invite and allowing us to speak. Uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I want to give a bit of an overview of Forest and its activities um, related to, sorry, I just can't see my screen anymore. Okay, there we go. Uh, related to setting the stage, essentially, for the development of a new sector in stream tidal energy in Canada. And Really, what force contributes to is trying to create an aura of predictability and public acceptance around around this new form of ocean energy. 
in which, which in our view, uh, enables or incents the investment uh, developers to go and raise the financing required to keep the industry going. So I'll give you a little bit of overview of FORCE, some of our activities, and, and how we propose to do that. In, so FORCE was created in 2009 with the, role, uh, with the goal of learning about tidal energy. And essentially with funding from the federal government and the provincial government in Canada, plus a combination of funding from private sector, FORCE fulfills two, two overall roles. One is that we operate a uh, common facility or where we host. Uh, operating a test center on the shores of the Minas Passage in the Bay of Fundy. And two, we act as project steward, which involves ensuring the regulatory approvals are in place, uh, communicate our findings broadly with the public, uh, and then promote R&D related to tidal energy. And so our work centers around understanding if tidal energy uh, has a future role uh, as part of uh, Canada's uh, energy uh, distribution. And to do that, we're gonna to have to essentially ask ourselves two main, or find the answers to two main questions. And, and that's essentially, is the technology viable uh, and, and is it safe for the environment? And I think if we can get answers along those lines, we can start to create a broader public acceptance uh, that'll help ensure that this industry has a pathway of predictability uh, for it. So just a quick overview of in-stream tile energy. Uh, essentially, in-stream tidal energy harnesses the natural flow of uh, ocean and river currents to generate uh, renewable energy. Um, it's very much a response to other forms of uh, potentially more environmentally harmful ocean energy or um, hydrokinetic energy, uh, such as dams or uh, barrages. And one of the key advantages of tidal energy is that it's essentially it's predictable. You can know the output today, tomorrow, 100 years from now, and that sets it apart from other forms of renewable. So there's great interest in understanding what role tidal energy plays in our, in our energy mix. So why are we looking at that here in Nova Scotia? Well, essentially we have, there's two main reasons for this, is we have a tremendous resource, but we also have a need. Uh, while Canada and specifically Nova Scotia has made great gains in the adoption of renewables over the last 10 years, in Nova Scotia, we still uh, generate electricity uh, from, from fossil fuel sources. And that, that's 60% of our ener energy electrical generating sources. So we need to make a change. Um, and that's why tidal energy may present an opportunity for us to, to invest uh, further in. Uh, the other reason why we're looking at tidal energy in Nova Scotia, we have this tremendous resource. The Bay of Fundy is often referred to as the Everest of tidal. Uh, in the Minas Passage alone, which is the narrow constriction between the upper and lower parts of the bay, it's estimated that there's 7,000 megawatts of resource available. And just to put that in perspective, that's greater than all of elect electricity demand in Atlantic Canada. So the resource is immense. We see uh, current flows in that region of up to 20 kilometers an hour. So um, it's, it's really one of the foremost tidal energy resources on the planet. But what makes it such a resource also can make it a challenge to work in. And that's really where force comes into play. One thing I do want to mention is that also that what's incenting investment in, in this project and in Canada related to marine renewables is that in Nova Scotia, there's a Marine Renewable Energy Act. Um, essentially, the Marine Renewable Energy Act creates uh, a, an efficient, transparent, clear pathway for the growth of the industry. So it's really setting the stage for that predictability. It also, hope, it also aims to ensure that uh, the industry develops sustainably with an eye to environmental protection and that communities, local communities, uh, also have their voices heard in how this uh, industry progresses. From a developer perspective, though, what's key is that it gives the right to each developer to actually extract tidal en energy from the ocean. And really, that's the cornerstone that it's allowing for the, invest the inward investment uh, to support some of these projects. Also in Nova Scotia, to incent this demonstration, there's a feed-in tariff Presently, that feed-in tariff is 53 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's really a, that really reflects the demonstration nature of where this industry is at right now. That premium for the, for the electricity really recognizes that there's a lot of learning that has to happen. And so we all have this responsibility uh, for those of us involved in the sector to really share the outcomes of what's happening 
to make sure that the rate payers that are financing some of these projects through that feed-in tariff rate get, in the sense, get a real sense of the value of title uh, and how we can potentially see cost reductions uh, going forward. So like I say, Force, Force was, Force, we're not a developer, we're not a title developer. We're a company that was created to study the potential for title energy in Nova Scotia. And we're really gonna do that uh, by answering questions around the viability of the technology, the safety of the technology and the environment, and can it coexist with other users of the Bay of Fundy? And we do that principally, as, as I mentioned before, by being the host of a title demonstration facility, but being the steward of a project that promotes learning about title, sharing, sharing the results of our research, and making sure that the whole project operates under the eye of, of regulatory compliance. So first, just a quick overview of what I mean by a host, a facility. Uh, at our facility, it's, it's uh, on the sh in the Minas Passage on the shores of the Bay of Fundy. We have five offshore berths connected with 11 kilometers of subsea power cables. We have a 30 meg megabar um, uh, substation, uh, 30 megawatt substation that connects the offshore side of the project with Nova Scotia's transmission system. We have a visitor center that acts as our point of presence within the community, but also as a hub for research and operations that originate from the site. And over the last 10 years, we've amounted a considerable uh, amount of resource data that allows or helps developers anticipate the projected revenues from some of these projects. The other, the other role that we fulfill is related to environmental stewardship. And so, Around this area, it's, it's mostly about answering questions on the safety of these devices and can they coexist with other users of the Bay of Fundy. So our, our role is uh, in the project delivering the, in, the environmental stewardship side of this project, in our view, really promotes public acceptance of the project and, and help ensure that all regulators feel, or all stakeholders within the project feel some degree of connection to the demonstration project that's presently underway. A key component of our environmental stewardship responsibilities is uh, FORCE delivers an environmental monitoring program. Um, so we try and assess potential impacts of these, of these devices as they are installed. The effects monitoring program is really based on work that FORCE had done uh, back in 2010, 2011 related to the environmental assessment as well as a considerable amount of baseline research that has happened. And it really focuses on five key areas, that being marine mammal, fish, seabirds, lobsters, uh, and then understanding to what extent these devices generate subsea noise in the environment. The, this EEMP, as referred to it, um, really is about testing the predictions about impacts of tidal turbines on the environment that we kind of identified during the EA process. But it's also adaptive, reflecting the fact that in this industry right now, there is no standard about how to go about environmental monitoring a specific uh, undersea turbine. So we, we need to be flexible in terms of learn as you go, essentially, what works best and keep applying that. This is all under the watchful eye of Canadian regulators. Uh, and our results from this program, first, we, get, we, we share those with regulators but then we broadly share the results of this work with the public. And in fact, that, that material forms a great, uh, a great percentage of our public engagement material. Uh, working in these high flow sites or generating reliable data from these high flow sites is pioneering work, but it, it's key to scientific transparency. Uh, there's no doubt that if title is going to grow, and it must grow sustainably. And the cornerstone to growing sustainably is having the confidence that we can accurately measure, measure potential impacts of these devices. And for us, we spent a lot of time uh, investing in research and development related to uh, enhancing our ability to monitor these devices. Typically, oceanographic sensors were not made, uh, they're not durable enough to survive, they're not made, they're not designed to function in the types of high flow environments that we, we need for tidal energy. There's a lot of work to do to understand how to deploy them, how to translate the data that they're collecting into useful information, both from a resource assessment perspective, but also from a regulatory environmental impact perspective. And then finally, our role with respect to stewardship 
also involves sharing information. And um, in this respect, I would say that uh, given the nascent nature of, of the tidal energy sector, we are highly dependent upon government leadership and support um, for a variety of reasons. As mentioned earlier, to create the legislation that provides predictability, to provide the early stage financing and the production incentives like the feed in tariff, and to generally uh, create the policy that promotes the use of or the adoption of renewable energy. And it's our view that, and it's our experience, that the government will not be supportive of, of projects like tidal energy unless there's broad public acceptance. And the only way we can generate public acceptance in the project is making sure that various stakeholder groups are essentially part of the project in some meaningful way. Communities, First Nations in Canada, uh, different levels of government, they want to see transparency. They want to make sure that there's confidence in the data that we're collecting, that we, we have an ability to monitor effects. They want to make sure that what we're doing aligns to public policy. And for that reason, one of the key outputs that FORCE delivers is to really focus on sharing information about the sector uh, and communicating the results of our research. Just a quick overview of some of the work we've done in the Bay of Fundy. There's presently, there's eight active developers for tidal energy in the Bay of Fundy, uh, five of those specifically at FORCE. And so while we're blessed with a lot of potential activity, one of the things we really do need to see at the moment is get these projects advanced get tidal turbines into the water so that we can monitor them, we can learn from the, comp the complicated marine operations that surround these, uh, that, that surrounds the installation of tidal energy devices and deploying of the sensors to monitor them. And we have to understand how, how this industry can coexist with other users of, of the ocean, like First Nations and fishers and researchers and recreational users because it won't progress until we can understand that tidal energy does have a role and that it is broadly accepted. And so, from our view, the future of tidal energy is highly dependent on public support and FORCE's role is to really try and, and promote public acceptance of the technology by sharing everything we learn. And so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I'll move on now to the next speaker, which is Mario Vieira, a PhD in Leaders for Technical Industries. And Mario is currently an energy consultant with the Collaborative Laboratory Plus Atlantic. Um, Mario will speak uh, about or will introduce the Atlantic Lab for Future Technologies, Ocean Act. Uh, Mario, thank you very much, and uh, please go ahead. Hello, thank you, Luisa. Good afternoon to all. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect, Mario. It's perfect, okay. So, yeah. good afternoon. I'm here to present the Ocean Act Initiative and Atlantic Lab for Future Technologies. This initiative, which is being led by several uh, entities, proposes an European Center sorry, an European Center for the development, testing, demonstration and qualification of technology-based innovative services and products with technolo technology readiness levels ranging from five to eight for the blue economy. We intend to build on the existing infrastructures in Portugal to use uh, the energy produced by innovative devices in conjunction with the with the operational ocean, oceanography uh, knowledge from the high observatory and ocean robotics sensoring and communication technologies from tech for c so who are our potential markets technology developers that are developing devices on the areas of offshore wind energy and data storage wave energy ocean monitoring and surveillance, ocean robotics, aquaculture, and ocean cleaning and protection. Our value proposition is to accelerate the development of technologies associated with the economy of the sea, reducing their time to market by providing an integrated service offer in a one-stop shop logic, supported by our associates 
the industrial sector and the scientific and technological ecosystem existing in Portugal. So, who are we? The Ocean Act is being promoted by five entities, which are WEVEC, Plus Atlantic, SAIA, Forum Ocean, and Inesc Tech. Plus, we have 22 formal expressions of interest from national and international entities. Currently, Ocean Act is in its installation phase, and we intend on legally formalizing Ocean Act throughout the next year. So I told you before that we want to build on the infrastructures which already exist. And two of these are the Agusadora test site and the Viana do Castelo test site. The Agusadora test site is located off the coast on the north of Portugal, five kilometers off the coast, with an average depth of 45 meters. This test site was used previously in the past to test other technologies such as the AWS Archimedes that we spoke in this, in this seminar this morning, the Pelamis and the wind float prototype. Plus, it will be the test site where Core Power will test their high, Highway 5 project starting next year. The offshore connection still has available around 2 megawatts for other projects. On the other hand, the Viena do Castelo test site lies 17 kilometers off the coast with an average depth of 100 meters. This site is currently the house of wind float Atlantic and the offshore connection still has the capacity of more 55 megawatts that can be used for more projects. Also, we want to generate synergies with tech 4 c Tech4C is an infrastructure from Inesc Tech, one of our associates, that supports the research, development, test and demonstration of new technologies and solutions focusing on marine robotics and autonomous systems, technologies, materials and underwater systems, broadband communication and acoustic systems. Plus, Tech4C assets include research vessels, uh, autonomous unmanned vehicles and state-of-art data acquisition platforms. Finally, we also want to generate synergies with the High Observatory, which is a cross-border observatory in the field of operational oceanography, with extensive experience on the prediction of weather conditions in the regions of the north of Portugal and Galiza. So what we offer is an integrated service based on a one-stop shop rationale. We support technology developers on these four stages, licensing and installation, operation, validation and certification. Plus, we can act as a broker to provide additional services and products from our associates, partners and other local, regional or national industries. Uh, including those from the Galiza region. So we offer a center of interregional cooperation with accessible geographic location and an open Atlantic exposure. We offer access to infrastructure with more than 80 megawatts of capacity and a wide testing range of technology readiness levels. We also have the capacity to test different technologies and also to provide support services to technology developers. Plus, the existence of highly comp competent value chains will enable OceanNet to differentiate its offer. Uh, for example, the ecosystem of universities and R&D centers, the existence of the international airports in both north of Portugal and in Galiza, the relevant ports infrastructure and also the industry, for example, the metalworking, the wind and the sensorization industries that exist in this part of the Iberian Peninsula. So what are we looking for? We're looking for technology developers that want to test their technologies in real offshore conditions off the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. And these, these technologies can be from the areas of energy, aquaculture, 
ocean surveillance and ocean robotics, energy and data storage, and ocean cleaning and protection. We're also looking for potential partners to leverage our implementation and future activity, and also partners that want to promote an European network of test centers. We believe that the Ocean Act will bring added value for Portugal, such as on the generation of highly qualified employment, serving as complementarity to the activity of the tech for c infrastructure by attracting investment associated with implementation of new projects, by qualifying the industry the, to provide services and ocean products, by guaranteeing the continuity of the ecosystem generated with previous projects, and by promoting exportations. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. Uh, we will now move on to our last speaker for this session, um, uh, which is Nicholas Wallet. Uh, Nicholas, have you been able to join? Oh, perfect. Hi, Nicholas. Hi. Okay, so um, Nicholas Wallet. Um, okay. He's joining us from the European Marine Energy Center. Nicholas is based in Ireland and is currently dedicated to the floating offshore wind project afloat and mega uh, AWE, so airborne wind energy, as well as managing the um in the european marine energy center portfolio of projects um nicholas will speak about european regional development fund project blue gifts um uh, nicholas go ahead uh, please when you're ready can you see my presentation okay yes uh can you put it in full screen Better. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Let's go back. Fine. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the open access to testing Blue Growth on Innovation Fast Track that we call Blue Gift Project. It's an interreg project, Atlantic Era, uh, and we 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 mentioned a few times uh, some key element uh, about uh, how important it is to get get the metal wet, so get, get some of this uh, technology into the water and thoroughly test it. What BlueGIF uh, offer is uh, access, uh, access to test centers, incubators that are going to uh, help the technology developer to basically plug and play with their technologies. So uh, BlueGIF is a partnership of uh, seven marine renewable energy test sites across the Atlantic area. You can see on the right side uh, the map of all the test sites. Uh, so you've got uh, two types of test sites in, uh, in Blue Gift. So the test site where all the testing is going to happen in Blue Gift are the one in the south. So starting from Cineo near Bordeaux in France, then you have BMEP, uh, you have uh, WEVEC, you have PLOCAN. These test sites are really here to host the testing during Blue Gift. The test site, test site from the north, so IMEC, uh, Smart Bay, and Ecole Centrale de Nantes are uh, previous partners on, a 4C, on the 4C project. And uh, what they are helping the uh, test site from the south really in this project is to bring the know how developed under uh, this 4C project that uh, been seeing 30 technologies deployed in uh, offshore condition. So, uh, why is it that we're trying to achieve? Uh, we're going to go backward here. Uh, so, open access to testing to boost my renewable in, in three words. Uh, what we believe is testing, testing, testing. We need to test technologies uh, going offshore. 
that is key to reduce uh, the cost of access to the site. And, and what we see quite often is it is difficult for the technology developer to get this final fairly limited amount of money to go offshore testing, to use, uh, to have marine operation and, uh, and to operate for a certain period offshore. So uh, what uh, a program like BlueGift does is using incubator site, uh, this test site we presented on the previous slide, uh, get uh, funding from the European Commission uh, via Interreg in, in this case, and, uh, and hosting the technology developer at no cost. So using the infrastructure of this test site at no cost. And the, the, the test site takes the risk with the funder to, uh, to get uh, their, the, the use of the infrastructure rainbows there. Uh, we're looking for testing about eight technologies. And, and at the same time, once you've done the testing, it's a perfect opportunity to also support the technology developer on their commercialization pathway. So uh, in this purpose, we raised 2.5 million of uh, European Regional Development Fund with Interreg AA, Atlantic Era. Uh, we opening three competitive calls. Uh, and we talk about stated earlier, but uh, basically in a short version, uh, to get public support, you need to have a competitive call. So that's why we do this competitive call. So the main criteria is how quickly are you able to go offshore testing? The project is uh, limited in time. Uh, it, it, uh, it can't afford uh, to be given back to the European Commission late. So the, when the technology developer uh, can deploy is the absolutely key criteria. Uh, and then the knowledge sharing to optimize the results. So that's why we've got this partnership, this network of test sites. Uh, and the challenge is demonstration reality. Uh, I keep repeating that. It's a critical stage on path to commercialization. So uh, the advantage Atlantic Era have with BlueGIF is we build up on some success from before. Uh, Forsy had a similar type of pattern. And we also bring uh, together all the leading facilities in the Atlantic Era, all these key test sites, these incubators for the technology developers. So talking about this uh, test site from uh, the software, the testing is going to happen. Uh, here is Plokan uh, with uh, floating offshore wind on wave and Wevec with floating offshore wind on wave. BMAP as well, same floating offshore wind on wave. And, and the last one is, um, no, sorry, BMAP I forgot uh, for wave and Cineo for tidal. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the specific detail of all the test sites because it would take quite long. But uh, what we encourage everybody to do is to contact uh, directly the test site or contact the uh, uh, Merit at Smart Bay with the uh, coordinator for the uh, call or connect, uh, contact directly EMEC as well if you want to be uh, uh, put in contact with any of uh, the specific partners in this project. And, and um, I've got two more uh, slides uh, to show. Uh, first, I want to talk about the advantage of Blue Gift and why technology developer can be interested uh, and why also the public funder can be interested. So on the right side, it de-risks support for, it's, it's technology agnostic, we support uh, anybody that will be ready to provide a testing to be deployed within the timeline of the project. And uh, though we are focusing on energy, it's also possible to uh, think about enabling technology for offshore renewable energy. Uh, see, uh, and we do have a, a network of different infrastructure, different characteristics, and um, most certainly we can find the right fit for the testing needed by the develop technology developer. Uh, on the left side, I think it's maybe for the public body, what we can say is what BlueGift brings is because we do not focus on one single specific technology and we manage a pipeline, we are able to uh, take the risk on behalf of the funder to find who is going to uh, be able to test in the time, in the budget. Uh, and this is why we've got 
uh, a strong pipeline developed in the project. If, if one of the developers were to be late and miss the timeline, uh, we can still go to the next developer uh, in the line to find uh, a technology to deploy. So uh, currently, free technology, uh, free technology is deployed, and, uh, and we've got input from the test site, as I say, IMEC, Ecole Centrale de Nantes, and Smart Bay. And here, the last uh, slide is uh, BlueGIF open a third call. So that is uh, a call open from today. Uh, you can visit uh, the BlueGIF website to find all the documents. The application form itself is pretty simple. Uh, as I say, the, the main point of uh, BlueGIF is not to assess thoroughly technology or uh, business models or levelized cost of electricity. It's not, it's not about that. The BlueGIF project is about de-risking the testing offshore for technology developer and, and the main criteria is how ready are you to go offshore. The, the, test, uh, the test site access coordinator is married in uh, SmartBen in Ireland and here's an email. So uh, Merit can uh, give you advice on how to uh, apply to the call. We encourage everybody to also contact the test site to talk about their testing plans. And, and uh, the last information, it closed the 2nd of April 21. So you do have a bit of time, but uh, not so long. And uh, that's, uh, that's the presentation for Boogie. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, I think we can move on now. Well, thank you to all speakers for your presentations. And I think we can now move um, to questions. Uh, I invite any member, any attendee to place the questions in writing if you wish, because we still have a bit of time to answer questions. Uh, I do have one question for Tony Wright. Um, Okay, so Tony, uh, what are the funding streams for the Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy? Uh, would you like to comment on that? Can you can you just repeat that for me, please, Louisa? Yes, of course. What are the funding streams for the Fundy for Force, Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy? Okay, no, great question. Uh, mm -hmm. So it varies. Um, I'll first start off by saying that the center itself was built with great public support. So with contribution from both levels of government in Canada, the federal government and our provincial government, combined with some private sector investment, built the facility itself. On a year-to-year on a -year basis, our funding primarily comes from birth fees. So if you are a developer that is a member of FORCE, essentially, there's an annual fee, uh, and our funding essentially derives from those fees. And from time to time, when we're lucky enough, uh, we can secure um, government grants, which are normally designed to support specific research-related activities. So at the moment, um, we're fortunate enough to have a grant from Natural Resources Canada that's helping us build the risk assessment model, essentially a collision and encounter risk assessment to try and understand what's the probability of marine life coming into contact with these devices. Uh, and so that's a good example of how from, you know, periodically we will receive grant funding to do specific pieces of work like that. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. I just forgot to mention that this question was placed by Antonio Sarmiento. Um, okay. So now, moving on, and we still have a bit of time. I, I, I have some questions prepared to each of you. Uh, and so I would start with um, Elena. Elena, you mentioned uh, during your presentation the EEA grants. Uh, we also had a speaker at the seminar last year uh, from the EA grants. 
Um, so this mix funding from abroad with public funding. And I would like to ask you to share uh, some thoughts in respect of other financing mechanisms available uh, for blue economy projects at an international or EU level. Okay, thank you, Luisa, for that question. So the, the presentation I gave was mostly focused on national funding. However, uh, you have uh, European uh, funding schemes, some of them directed uh, towards the blue uh, economy, mostly EASN um, calls uh, that deal with the FEAMP uh, also funds. Uh, so, for example, they had the blue labs and the blue careers and, and some of these calls uh, in, the past, uh, in the recent past. And they are constantly opening calls that are directed towards blue economy. You also have, under the Horizon 2020 uh, program, you also have some calls that are, uh, some of them are green and blue, so they are open to uh, green and blue uh, funding. But um, you have other sources of funding. For example, you have JPI Oceans and uh, Bio-Based Industries Consortium, so BBI. Uh, JU. Uh, this is mostly focused on, so GPI is broad in oceans and BBI is focused on bioeconomy. But for example, under BBI, you have um, uh, calls that are uh, focusing on aquatic uh, marine resources. So this is a, a potential also for, for this type of, of, of projects under the blue economy. This being said, if you're a, a pro an innovative project and uh, um, a company uh, that is fast growing uh, with an innovative project. I think one of the best um, funding schemes available in Europe at the moment is what people used to know as the SME instrument that has recently changed name and now it's called EIC Pilot Accelerator uh, Program. It has two phases. Uh, you, so the first one is a, is a smaller grant, which I'm not going to talk about. I don't think it's suitable for most of these projects. But the second uh, type of grant is the old SME instrument phase two. Now it's the IC pilot accelerator grant. And this is a blended finance. What does this mean? This is a 2.5 million um, lost fund uh, grant. So it's free money, just to, it's a grant. And the, the promoters that have this grant can also have the option, it's their option, to have blended finance of up to 15.15 million euros in equity from the Commission. So this is a, quite an innovative, uh, I, I would say, a methodology for Europe. And it is also, because of the amounts, it's also a very competitive uh, program. So there's a, a low success rate. But I've been a jury in this in this uh, program. I've seen a lot of companies uh, uh, coming to this, and I must say that you know the, the 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 success rate is low because everybody applies to this. And of course, then the, when you compare the number of applications with the number of grants, it seems very low. But if you actually have a good project, and we have very good success cases in Portugal as well, um, this is one of the best programs you can have because this is for one company only. So it's not a consortium program, it's, a, it's, a, it's an accelerator money grant for, for companies. Uh, internationally, uh, now uh, under the Atlantic Arch, so you have the Atlantic Strategy uh, Plan, which is also designing some, some programs and some projects, uh, calls that some of them might be under the renewable energies focus, which is also very interesting to, to be on the, on the watch out. And Portugal has a seat on this Atlantic Strategic Committee. So when the calls open, we at uh, the Ministry of the CN, the GPM will announce it. Uh, and also, uh, there are some other, like the, the anchor program, there are some other uh, big Atlantic projects that are funding some of these initiatives. So I think this would be mostly the main uh, international fundings I would look out for. Okay, thank you very much, Helena. Yes, uh, totally. Okay, um, so I have a question now for uh, Tony. Um, so my question is, 
Oh, sorry. Th this next question was for Nicholas. Sorry, Tony, <laughs> for Nicholas. Okay. So for promoters that intend to apply for aid under the third call launched by Blue Gift today, uh, could you share uh, or detail a bit what are the main features that the particular projects should have in order to be successful? Okay, so as I say, the, the main criteria is really, are you going to be able to deploy uh, within a short time scale? Because mm -hmm. the project is uh, need, need to have some results between 21 and 22. So if you're not able to deploy something offshore uh, within 21, 22, you're going to have a difficult time to make a good application. Uh, and, and the application itself is very easy. It's, 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 it's a simple budget. It is a simple uh, description of uh, the level of the technology readiness level, uh, just to see if it's fit with offshore testing. Uh, and, and then really trying to showcasing as much evidence as possible that uh, your technology is ready. Uh, so the test site, you, you should probably already know all the test site because if you're around this technology readiness level, ready to deploy, you most likely spoke to them. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think it, don't don't be disheartened if uh, if you're not fitting into this specific uh, uh, requirement. Uh, in the past, we had 4C, we have uh, Blue GIF, we have Ocean Demo for uh, different uh, for other sites as well. So uh, I think the, the the European Commission's been showing. It's interest in supporting this type of activity, supporting the test site incubator. Uh, so I'm pretty confident that Blue Gift uh, will have some, you know, um, other project in the future. And if if you're not ready before 24, you will have something different then. Thank you, Nicholas. Okay, so I'll move on to to Mario now. Um, Okay, then to Mario. Mario, based on your experience, what should, would you say are the main features that blue economy projects should have, and maybe in particular marine renewable energy project, projects, in order to achieve support under the Ocean Act? And how can the Ocean Act contribute to the funding of these projects? So, Luisa, thank you. Uh, in fact, Ocean Act wants to wants to be a partner of technology developers. So we don't have requirements on features that the, these technologies need to have. Well, they certainly need to have uh, a technology readiness level that is at least a proof of concept. And these 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 technologies should be capable of sustaining the ocean conditions that we find in the north of of Portugal, but uh, what we can do uh, in, uh, in Ocean Act is to collaborate with these technology developers in finding the necessary uh, funding schemes, the necessary financing, and this is uh, how, how can we how can we do this? The fact is that the associates, the current associates of Ocean Act, uh, Wavec, say uh, Plus Atlantic. Uh, Forum Oceano and Inertec have extensive experience in, in participating and in supporting uh, and in the licensing processes of uh, new technologies. So this is the, the type of support that we can offer, is, uh, is helping in the, in the financing processes. Okay, thank you, Mario. Uh, and now finally, Tony, um, so your, your second question. My question to you would be uh, similar to what I just asked to Mario. Uh, so based on your particular experience, what are the main characteristics that the project should have in order to be developed or, or tested at the Bay of Fundy? So to have yeah, access. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, obviously, uh, what we're looking at uh, in the in the Bay of Fundy, we're specifically at four, so projects that have reached a certain TRL level, 
that are, are ready to move beyond testing to to the stage of commercial projects. And and so th those are the successful applicants that are really gaining entry into force at the moment. Okay. Um, but I, but I will add one of the things that still really needs to be addressed by both the, the developers broadly, sites like Forest and EMAC, uh, and and various levels of government, is the predictability around permitting and licensing these devices. And so, while we have agencies like our Department of Energy that want to uh, advance demonstration of tidal energy. They, they see a, a future potential where tidal energy can contribute to a cleaner energy future in our province. There's still other regulators involved, whether that's with navigable waters, uh, and there's also the environmental permitting side of it. And they're just collectively, globally, there's just has not been enough installation yet to give some certainty around that permitting. And that can cause a project a great deal of angst. You can have the perfect device, but if you have uncertainty related to environmental permitting your project, there is no project. You're, you're not going to be able to raise the required financing or the investment to deliver that project. And, and so we're in a bit of a catch-22 period here in Canada at the moment where we need more devices in order to properly understand all the aspects of the project, the, the complications around the marine operations, uh, the potential impacts these devices have on the environment, and how these projects can co coexist with other users of the Bay of Fundy, other like the fishing industry, for instance, and First Nation communities. And until we make some progress on that, we are going, we're going to have slow progress. And so we need these first devices to be installed, yet we have no, we don't really have the required certainty around the permitting and the knowledge mm -hmm. about the coexistence. So I think from my perspective, what we really do need are these first demonstration projects up and running long term for us to build that broad level of predictability and public acceptance. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Um, we still have a few minutes, three minutes, so I would like to ask just one final question to Elena. Um, I think it could be interesting if you could give us one example of funding granted recently for blue economy projects in Portugal. Okay, but I, I assume you would like me to give an example on the renewable energies. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> um, uh, I think another type of project, if you prefer. Um, I would, I would have to think. But for example, under the EEA grant uh, mm -hmm. scheme, uh, I think it was on call one which is focused on uh, small and medium enterprises innovation. Sorry. Um, I think we've, we granted uh, a project, uh, which I don't want to say the name, because I'm not mm -hmm. sure if this is out there uh, already, uh, okay. because we are just approving projects, so I'm trying to figure out in my head if this is one of the already announced ones or not. But for example, we are approving uh, the first projects for offshore aquaculture okay. coupled with offshore uh, uh, wind and wave energy. Uh, and this is an EAE grant and the location is in Portugal, of course, because these projects have to have an implementation in, under Portuguese waters uh, and with Portuguese jobs and growth. So this is one example of the projects we funded through this scheme. Um, and and I'm, I know there are more uh, being evaluated at the moment, so we do have um, for for the renewable uh, for the marine renewable energies, I think the grant is a great program uh, to, to look for. And if you couple it, uh, for example, if it's uh, multi platforms uh, that we are talking about, it might also have uh, some funding under the Mar 2030, which is a new pro new program starting next year. 
in, in, in parallel with this, with this program. So this is one type of project that we are uh, financing. For example, we are now dealing with uh, a, a company that wants to install the first wave uh, near shore uh, energy system uh, uh, here in Portugal and we are trying to look for potential funding for, for this, uh, this company as well. Because sometimes it's hard to, you know, these programs have been designed a few years ago so they have a set of rules and we can only fund under this set of rules and mm -hmm. innovation moves sometimes faster than, than the programs uh, adapt to. And this is also something that in the public side, uh, we are trying to, to, to make it easier uh, to, to adapt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Louisa, can I make a question? Yes, yeah. of course. I want just to ask to Nicholas a question uh, for the scheme that just opened now. Is the scheme valid only for those, um, what do you call it, testing sites? So people can only apply to those testing sites? So uh, there's a funding supporting the testing site. So the difficulty would be if you need infrastructure outside these partners, this testing site, it will be difficult to uh, to find a way to fund financing them so yeah just to be extra clear the funding is given to the test site for their operational cost uh, okay. so it don't mean it's impossible it means that you've got a financing issue if you need uh, infrastructures okay. that are not within these sites yeah okay thank you <laughs> okay thank you both thank you to all the speakers i think we have reached our 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 limits now and uh, so um, Jeanette please confirm but I think that thank you very much Louisa and thank you for all the speakers of this panel for the presentations thank you very much